taking a look at some E3D clones. Um, these are like ultra cheap, three, four dollars on AliExpress, shipped to your door. Um, at that price point, it's shocking that you actually get uh, anything at all. Um, but they have some redeeming values. But I think there's some words of caution as well um, for people who are thinking about spending four dollars instead of eighty dollars for a real one. So let's uh, let's dive into it, and we'll talk about what we find. Okay, so here we go. Um, these are the clones, and there's obviously two different models here, and one is a Bowden tube model of the V6. Again, this is a clone. This is not a genuine E3D. And then the other is the V5, and this one is in a direct drive configuration, so filament feeds directly into the top, no Bowden tube. The V6 is probably what most people are going to be interested in. Um, to be honest, I don't even know why they're still cloning the V5. Uh, it's certainly usable. Um, actually, I had a V5 clone that I used in one of my uh, Prusas. Um, boy, almost two years ago now, I think. And there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but you lose a little bit of, of height because it's a longer it's a longer hot end. And the groove mount is actually not the same dimension as the V6. So you have to print something custom for it. You can't just swap it in and out. A little bit annoying. But it's interesting. Um, it's still ultra cheap, and we'll talk about it um, in the second part of the video. But let's start off with the V6 because, again, I think that's what most people would be interested in. Okay, so I'm going to post links to everything, by the way, um, from the actual sellers that I actually ordered these from in the description below um, in case by the end of this you think that um, it's something that you want to you wanna try out. But let's, uh, let's take this guy apart and see how close they got, what level of craftsmanship is actually present or not present for that matter. All right, so I've separated this guy into the major components that functionally make, make up the hot end. And so at the bottom here, we've got the heater block, we've got a heater cartridge, we've got a glass bead thermistor. They don't actually specify what thermistor this is, but... If I had to put money on it, it's probably a EPCOS or EPCOS thermistor with a beta value of, of uh, like 3950. That would be that would be very common for these Chinese hot ends. Um, we've got a brass nozzle, 0.4 millimeter. Um, it's direct E3D style, obviously, um, drop in. And it's got the appropriate clamping style heater block. Um, some of the clones floating around still use the the set screw like the V5 did, but they're calling it a V6 clone. Um, and the purpose behind this is that it supports slight variations in heater block diameter without having a big air gap if you're using the smaller diameter heater block, uh, rather heater cartridge in the heater block. So this just kind of conforms and creates a nice surface area uh, contact um, regardless of the actual diameter of your heater cartridge. So um, nothing all that exciting going on here. The threading feels uh, feels fairly nice in terms of of threading into the the heater block. There's no burrs or or uh, or catching that occurs. The uh, face of the nozzle is nicely machined and beveled so that you're not going to get um, filament binds on it. And if we look at the throat next, or heat break as it's often called. Um, it is Teflon lined, so this is not an all metal variant, nor was it sold as one. So they didn't say all metal hot end, they said metal hot end with Teflon liner. So they advertised it properly, they weren't trying to, they either, one, they didn't uh, advertise it improperly or be misleading, and it seems like they, they covered all the major functionality points when they advertised it, so they weren't just selling some random thing and then calling it whatever, uh, whatever they felt like. The threads on these are very clean and there is the, uh, the proper taper to the top end of the heat break. This end is designed to have a Teflon tube, actually your Bowden tube, go all the way through the top end of the heat sink and seat right into here for a fully constrained filament path. And this actually makes it an excellent choice for flexible filament because 
if I take a little piece of, of tube here, if this was your Bowden tube, this would seat into there, and you'd be driving your filament through this tube all the way from your extruder through the heat break and right into the mount zone with no air gaps to allow the filament to buckle or to seize. So um, this hot end actually would be a great flexible filament hot end. Um, and actually, um, full disclosure, I actually use one of these very clones on one of my uh, 250 millimeter Prusas and I print NinjaFlex with it. <clears throat> so it's not just theoretically works, it actually works for it. Um, <clears throat> now that said, with these, because they are produced so inexpensively and there's basically no quality control, you absolutely have to take the whole thing apart when you get it, check every machine surface for burrs, uh, test filament, a fil piece of filament through the, through the path to make sure there's nothing that's catching, nothing that's the wrong diameter. Um, so you have to basically be quality control when you get these to verify that it's actually going to work for you. Um, there's, <laughs> there's no guarantee, and aside from these guys basically getting um, packaged up in bubble wrap and kicked out the door, I'm sure nobody looks at them after they get out of raw manufacturing. So just an FYI. Buyers beware, I guess you could say. And I'm sure there's no customer support, no warranty, and for all intents and purposes, no returns because who's going to pay to ship this thing back to China um, if it doesn't work, because I'm sure they're going to make you pay for it. And since it only cost you 3 or $4 in the first place, that's not going to happen. So let's talk about assembly on this then. Um, assembly is fairly straightforward. Your throat heat break um, will thread into the heat sink here. Um, it will thread into the heater block. Now, there's a proper way to assemble these when it's actually going into your printer, and that involves um, loosening the brass nozzle about that much, heating the assembly up to 200 to 230 degrees, depending on where you're going to be printing the most. If you're going to be printing on the higher end, you're going to want to heat it up to the higher end, like ABS temperatures. Um, and then you you start to tighten this back until there's just barely a gap visible between the top of the nozzle nut and the heater block and then you tighten it so that it's tightening the nozzle into the bottom of the heat break and creating that that tight seal so you don't get filament oozing out of the top of your uh, your block assembly and making a giant mess um, the thread tightness between the heat break and the heat sink actually isn't that critical. It needs to be tight, don't get me wrong, but there should be no filament melting in this portion. It doesn't need to be liquid tight, it just needs to be tight enough so you get good thermal contact between the heat break and the heat sink so it can keep it cool and do its job. But aside from that, um, it's not as critical as the seal between the bottom of the heat break and the top of our nozzle. Um, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they tighten the nozzle first so they tighten the nozzle super tight and then they tighten down the heat break on top of it and then it gets heated up everything expands radially and then you get oh, a little bit of loosening action between the heat break and the nozzle and then suddenly you get melted plastic getting pushed through the threads out the top of the heater block and um, next thing you know you're gonna have to take the whole thing apart and clean it out or maybe perfect, you know, maybe completely jammed together, and you have to remove your your heat, um, your heater, and your thermistor, and burn the whole thing off with a torch, or just say hey, it was a four-hour hot end and throw it in the garbage or whatever. So, and what what makes it unfortunate is that there's really no difference between this hot end and a real E3D in terms of that assembly. So when people do it with their eighty-dollar genuine hot end, then they're really having a bad day because um, they spent so much money on it. Um, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I'm not saying don't support genuine E3D. They're the people who actually do the engineering, the design, the iterative testing. Um, and if you're looking for an absolutely plug-and-play solution with real customer support, real warranties, um, all of that, you know, that whole package, buy a genuine E3D. There's no, there's no doubt about it. You're going to get a, a great product. Um, however, if you're on a budget or you like to tinker or you're just intrigued, um, this is... This is a very interesting, a very interesting proposition. So, final assembly, 
um, our pneumatic adapter will thread into the top. And then we got to make sure that our Bowden tube doesn't just seat in here, but it actually continues to go down until it goes all the way into the hot end and seats in our throat, in that little section in the throat that I demonstrated earlier. Now, um, I, this is another place where people go wrong um, in that they push this down and they think they've got it seated, but they actually don't, and there's a gap. And then they think, great, I've got this fully constrained filament path, I can do flexible filament now, and they put their NinjaFlex in there, their TPU, <clears throat> and it buckles in that section because they didn't actually get this all the way in, and then they're super confused trying to figure out what went wrong. So one thing we can do is after we've done this to check is loosen this portion. Um, if you're having problems getting it to seat, what you can do is put a bevel, and actually it would be um, probably preferred to put a little bit of a bevel, just trim with, a, with a, a small sharp knife, a little bit of a bevel onto the end of the Bowden tube so it just seats you know, really nicely um, on the inside of that, of that throat. Okay, so that's basically all there is to say about the clone of the E3D V6. Um, personally, I've used it. It works fine. It prints great. Um, but it's a trade-off. You're trading off all bets of reliability um, in terms of out-of-the-box performance without going over every component to make sure that there aren't artifacts left in manufacturing that are going to ruin your print experience. There's definitely no support, um, and you're not supporting the company that actually designed it. So you have to decide you know, if that trade-off is worth it for you. Okay, real briefly, we'll take a look at the V5 clone. Um, again, they're the same price, and... It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to buy the larger, chunkier, bulkier version, but it's interesting nonetheless. It's basically the same design. Um, two small uh, differences. One, it's got the V5 block, so it uses a set screw to hold the heater cartridge in. This is the proper diameter of heater cartridge, so it makes good thermal contact, but those set screws don't have strong threads. So um, the reason why they replaced it um, in the V6 is because they got better clamping force with an actual M3 bolt squeezing uh, slit halves as opposed to just trying to push a heater cartridge in with a single grub screw. Two, you don't have a mechanism for actually um, clamping down the thermistor. It just kind of slides into this channel that's drilled all the way through. And if it's attached to your heater wires, that's probably fine. But the other design is just a little more secure. Um, and then on the heat sink side of things. Um, the heat break's a little bit different because there's no Bowden tube going into your system metal path. Um, the heat break is just constant diameter all the way up to the top. And again, Teflon lined. Um, we've got a nice bevel on the inside of the throat for aligning the filament as you, as you guide it in. This, by the way, would probably work okay for flexible filament. The only thing you've got to be a little bit worried about is the surface of the metal um, guide area from here until it gets to your throat. Um, just testing it with a piece of filament, it feels smooth and it feels uh, it feels catch free. Um, it's two millimeters so there's a little bit of a little bit of space there. but if you got a flexible filament in there and you started to feed feed at a little bit of a faster rate, it's possible that you would get a little bit of binding. It's hard to say without testing it. And I have not personally tested this with flexible filament. Like I said, um, years ago I actually used one of these um, as a primary hot end for Prusa, and it worked fine. But um, you lose you lose out on Z, Z print height because it's just a bigger hot end altogether. So that's that guy. It is what it is. All right. Thanks for watching. Um, subscribe. Comment. Let me know what you think, um, and also let me know about future videos, topics, things of that nature. Um, I always want to hear uh, what people are interested in, what problems you're facing with your 3D printing setup that uh, you want you want me to discuss. Thanks. Bye.